a scientist tries to establish when a murder occurred. His only clues are insects collected from the body. Forensic investigators puzzle over a partial skeleton found in a forest. They have two pieces of evidence to work with, a skull and a wasp's nest. In a trash-filled house, detectives find three people dead. Two of the victims are mummified. To solve the bizarre case, investigators rely on dead beetles. Insects may be the only witnesses to a crime, but bugs tell no tales. Or do they? To solve a murder, investigators often must unravel a tangled web of clues. Sun-kissed Hawaii is a vacationer's dream. Sand, surf, and balmy temperatures lure tourists by the thousands. But life in paradise can have a seamier side. In late December 1989, a search team scoured the forest near a small town on the island of Oahu. They were looking for clues in the disappearance of 32-year-old Roxanne Tandall. Family members were concerned because Roxanne hadn't shown up for work and no one had heard from her in days. Detectives Andrew Glushenko, Joe Self, and Rufus Kaukani received the call that she was missing. Relatives told police this wasn't Roxanne's normal behavior. If she was safe, she would have come home or called. They feared something terrible had happened. They were afraid Roxanne may have been killed. Neighbors believed that she had a violent quarrel with estranged husband, Benjamin, shortly before she disappeared. The couple were about to be divorced, with Roxanne gaining custody of their two sons. Neighbors heard loud noises and several thumps coming from Tandall's house. Suspicion quickly fell on Benjamin Tandall. Although Benjamin had appeared in person to report Roxanne's disappearance, Detective Kaukani thought Tandall's subsequent behavior was odd. What was kind of uh, suspicious about the report that was made by the husband at the Kahuku police station is that the officer asked for an identification, a photograph of her, so they could, you know, pass it around. Instead of taking a photograph and taking it back to the station, he picked up clothes and he went to Wailua, which is probably another 20 miles, 15 miles away, to wash clothes. And that's kind of not indicative of somebody who's caring and concerned about a missing person. All right, Dave. Suspicious that like foul play might be involved, police obtained a warrant and searched Roxanne's home. If Roxanne was alive, well, perhaps they could find we some clues to help locate her. Kitchen or the bathroom, Dave. If Benjamin had kidnapped or killed her, they needed evidence okay, to prove it. Investigators brought with them a Luma light, a device that makes blood and fingerprints visible. The operator's goggles cut through the glare of the bright blue light so he can pick out clues that would otherwise go unnoticed. The light revealed a fine mist of blood droplets on Roxanne's ironing board and in her bedroom. I see those smears, yeah, just like we thought. The search for a missing person suddenly became a murder investigation. 
anytime you have a surface with some blood on it and you hit it with, with, a, with a heavy force, it's going to fly out and spatter. And the harder that you hit it, the more force that you use, the finer that the spatter will be. Where was Roxanne Tandall's body? Prosecutors needed it to build a strong case. Without it, her killer would likely go free. Detectives raced against time. In Hawaii's tropical heat and humidity, corpses decay rapidly. Telltale clues can be lost. Evidence tying Roxanne's death to her killer could disappear entirely. A major break in the case came on New Year's Eve 1989, two weeks after Roxanne's disappearance. Hey guys, I think I found something over here. Searchers found the body of a human female. She had been wrapped in two blankets, both tied securely by fabric strips. Marks on the body suggested she was strangled and hit forcefully on the head. We found our victim, she's about a quarter of a mile south. Although her face was blackened and her body swollen, family members recognized the remains as Roxanne's. It's gonna be about 5.30. When investigators opened the blankets, flies emerged. Examiner and our forensics team to our location. Hi, guys. The next morning, detectives called University of Hawaii entomologist Lee Goff, one of the most respected insect scientists in the United States. How are you, Dr. Goff? Hey. Detective Glushenko, this is Detective Rufus Kalkani. He's Hi, Doc. Nice like it or not, insects are mankind's constant companions, thriving alongside us throughout our lives and well afterward. As a forensic consultant, Goff turns the abundance of insects to his advantage. His specialty is using bugs as a kind of biological stopwatch. If detectives hoped to tie this murder to Benjamin Tandall or to anyone else, they needed to get some answers from the bugs. Goff would act as their interpreter. Really, when you're dealing with insects, you're looking at the largest group of animals that are on the uh, face of the earth, the largest single group. A conservative estimate, very conservative, would give you three quarters of a million described species. And in reality, I think it's probably much closer to a million. Insects compete with us for food and shelter. At death, we may actually become their food and shelter. That's what Goff counts on. When he arrived at the crime scene, Goff was careful to collect all the insects he could. He snared flying bugs in a net. Others he picked off the body with tweezers. Goff would use the flies to pinpoint when the victim was killed. Because insects live, grow, and die in predictable intervals, their life cycles can be precisely timed out, sometimes down to the hour. And in order to figure out the actual time of death, you have to have as complete a collection as possible of all of the insects that you find on the body. And for each of those insects, then you have to know when they occur on the body and what their, the duration of their life cycle is. If you're working in the early stages of decomposition, say within the first two weeks, what you're really interested in are individual species of flies. In Hawaii's sultry climate, insects thrived on the victim's remains, providing Goff with ample specimens to work with. You look for the most mature uh, specimens that are there, but you try and get a general sampling of everything that's on the body, ex uh, either on wrappings, clothing, or actually on the surface. 
then as the body is removed, you want to look at what's crawling around on the soil underneath the body. Because very frequently, especially as decomposition progresses, you find that the center of arthropod activity shifts from the body itself to the kind of interface between the body and the soil. So you'll have a lot of things present there that are very significant in your estimation that aren't going to actually be on the body. Goff studied the samples at his lab at the University of Hawaii. After the female fly lays her eggs on a dead body, larvae soon develop. They're commonly called maggots. They secrete enzymes and spread bacteria, which enable them to consume human tissue. Goff believed that the maggots would tell the tale of the Tandall murder. But would they speak clearly enough to bring a murderer to justice? The life cycle of a fly is closely tied to our own. When a life ends, it's the beginning of a new generation of flies. A dead body is an invaluable source of food for hungry maggots. Flies begin to arrive moments after the host's death. Some unknown chemical from human remains attracts them from up to two miles away. As soon as they arrive, the females lay their eggs in protected areas natural body openings, wounds, and folds of skin. Generally here in Hawaii, the species we deal with, you're looking about 12 to 18 hours between the time the egg is laid and the egg hatches. Then you have your maggot. The maggots then congregate, and they feed together, they form this mass, and they're gonna move through the body together. So in any given mass, because not everybody lays their eggs at the same time, you may have maggots of several different species, and quite frequently different age classes. As they mature, maggots pass through five stages that entomologists call instars. From infant to adult takes several days to several weeks, depending on species and environmental conditions. Figure out what species is invading a body at a crime scene, observe the particular stage of its development, and you can trace an insect's short life back to the time of death of its human host. Lee Goff did just that to determine precisely when the victim was murdered. Armed with that information, police could check the alibis of any suspects. The initial analysis showed about 10 and a half days of insect activity. I knew it was longer than that. I knew there was uh, fair amount of literature that would back that up. Goff suspected the tightly wrapped blankets may have delayed the fly's arrival by several days. He realized he would have to fashion an experiment to simulate the same conditions under which the victim's body was discovered. To determine when the victim was killed, Goff relied on a staple of biological research, a dead pig. But to try and pin it down, what I actually did was get a 50-pound pig and duplicate the wrappings and place the animal out in a somewhat similar situation and then determine how long it took for the insects to actually go down and get to the point where they could oviposit on the, uh, on the pig. Goff unwrapped the pig periodically to check for signs of fly eggs. Nearly all of the insects collected from the victim's body were either maggots, adolescent, or adult flies. Although decomposed, it wasn't out long enough to attract many other insect species. After the first couple of weeks, you start running out of flies. And then we have to go into what we call succession. And this works the idea that any insect that feeds on the body is going to change it. And by changing the body, then it makes it attractive to another group of insects. And their feeding makes it attractive to yet another group, and so on down the line. During succession, entomologists expect to see a more or less orderly transition from one insect species to another as the bugs arrive at a corpse and begin feeding. 
Depending on the weather, the numbers and types of insects vary. Goff altered the amount of sun, shade, and water on the pig to mimic what may have happened to the victim's corpse. But how long did it take for the first egg-laying flies to arrive? Goff didn't need to wait long for an answer. He observed the first flies on the pig carcass two and a half days after it was left in the open, wrapped and bound. Goff added the time observed during the pig experiment to his initial time of death estimate of 10 and a half days. He was convinced the victim was murdered no fewer than 13 days before her body was discovered on December 31st. Those extra two and a half days made all the difference. Goff's estimate dovetailed almost exactly with the date of the victim's disappearance and the discovery of her body two weeks later on New Year's Eve. Neighbors told investigators they last saw her in the late afternoon of December 17th. She was sitting stiffly in the passenger seat of Benjamin Tandall's pickup truck. Brought in by police for questioning, Benjamin agreed to take a lie detector test. He failed. Then he asked for an attorney. Officers charged Benjamin Tandall with the murder of his wife. As they prepared for trial, the prosecution's case was bolstered by additional evidence. Detectives discovered that one of the blankets used to wrap the victim's body matched a photo of a blanket on a sofa in her home. And the blood stains found in her house during the police search matched her blood type. Benjamin Tandall was tried and convicted for the murder of Roxanne Tandall. On November 24, 1989, he was sentenced to life in prison. By establishing the timetable for the murder, Goff turned scattered clues into hard evidence. Whatever Dr. Goff did helped the case a lot, especially during trial. You have a victim, a female victim, who's missing for two weeks. Her husband is giving a story that uh, she had left to go out to a party, to work, and then afterwards she might have gone out with some friends. You run into the possibility that maybe she was killed a week before the body was found as opposed to two weeks. So I think during the trial, Dr. Goff's testimony supported a lot of the circumstantial evidence that we had against the defendant um, as far as um, when she was killed. The bugs had spoken and their wordless testimony allowed a committed team of investigators to bring a killer to justice. Elsewhere, thousands of miles away in the Tennessee mountains, insects helped identify a missing person. A young man on a walk stumbles upon bones that were picked clean. Nearby, a weathered skull held the clue that would help investigators make sense of the jumbled remains. Eastern Tennessee, nestled in the foothills of the Cumberland Mountains, is famous for its fresh air and small town charm. But the rural location also makes it an ideal place to dispose of murder victims. In January 1989, police received a call that a man had discovered a leaf-covered human skeleton. A 
Aside from some bits of tattered cloth and pieces of jewelry, little was left to indicate that this was once a living, breathing person. Police found no identification of any kind, no hints of who the victim might have been. They found no evidence of trauma, yet they suspected foul play. How else would the bones have gotten there? Detectives found little to tell them what happened, except for a dried out wasp's nest, long abandoned by its maker. Would it be enough of a clue? For help with the case, officers of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation contacted forensic anthropologist William Bass. Bass is an expert at reading human remains. He first established the age and sex of the victim. From the shape and size of the bones, he concluded that the skeleton belonged to a female who was not yet 18 when she died. But the cause of her death remained a mystery. Uh, there were no gunshots in the skull. There were no damage to any of the, of the uh, long bones or the bones of the body. Uh, we did not recover the hyoid bone, which is a bone in the neck, and which is one that you get when uh, you, you usually break if you strangle somebody. Although investigators were eager to find out how the girl died, they first tried to determine when she died in the hopes that it might lead to her identity. Boy lives right over here in this house. Where is he now? He went over home. I in the summer, uh, the soft tissue on the body in Tennessee uh, will disappear very rapidly. Uh, you can go from what you and I are now to a complete skeleton only about two weeks in July and August in Tennessee. If you die in the winter, it takes longer. If you die in the winter, by the following, uh, by the following spring or summer, uh, the brain would have decayed and the cranial vault, which is the inside of the skull, cranial vault would be dry by that time. At the crime scene, Bass looked at the wasp's nest. Knowing when it was made would help them pinpoint the victim's time of death. Wasps need a dry place to build their nests. Bass surmised the skull must have been on the ground for several months before it dried enough to become a suitable home for the insects. So what this tells me is in January when this skull was found, with a wasp nest in it, that individual had been dead and the skull dried the previous summer because this is when this wasp nest at least was, was built. To confirm his findings, Bass contacted forensic entomologist Neil Haskell to help him identify the victim. Haskell consults in criminal investigations all over the U.S. Like all insects, wasps live, breed, and die in predictable patterns. In Tennessee, they begin nest building in late April or May. By summer, the nest bustles with activity. Then, when the colder weather comes, the wasps die back. The cycle starts over again the following spring. Knowing this life cycle of this particular group of wasps enabled us to come up with a minimum time of the year that it took the wasps to build, plus another six to eight months for the skull to become cleaned and, and dry. In order for the queen wasp to have made her home there, the skull must have been completely dried out by spring 1988. Prior to the wasp's arrival, a brigade of egg-laying flies and carrion beetles must have foraged on the body and cleaned the skull late in the summer of 1987. Both Bass and Haskell concluded that the young girl died no later than midsummer 1987. Uh, we coupled the, the developmental time of the wasp plus the normal insects that eat the carrion and came up with an estimate of at least a year and a half prior to finding this uh, the skeletal remains that the person probably died. Now that was a minimum time. It could have been a little longer. In reality, it turned out that the, uh, uh, the body had actually been out there since uh, 
February of, of two years prior to the time we found the, the ring. The wasp nest had given investigators the information they desperately sought. Once they knew how long the girl had been dead, they began their hunt for her identity. They narrowed their search to teenage girls reported missing in 1987. They also took note of the jewelry found near the body. Investigators pulled a report detailing the disappearance of a young girl. In a photograph attached to the report, she wore some of the same jewelry found at the crime scene. The girl's name was Michelle Denise Anderson. She was 15 years old when she disappeared. Denise was last seen at a party on January 9, 1987. When she didn't come home the next day, her mother reported her missing. Until police knew more about her disappearance, they considered Denise a runaway. Investigators had solved only part of the mystery. They knew Denise's name, and because of her age and the condition of the bones, that she was healthy when she died. They are convinced Denise was murdered, but they still don't know how. And no one has ever been charged with her murder. The case remains open. The investigation continues. The stories that bugs tell can fill in the missing pieces of a death investigation. For detectives in an Indianapolis suburb, insects would provide the only leads to three bizarre and puzzling deaths. Counted in the trillions, insects vastly outnumber any other creatures on Earth. Florida tropical biologist James Kastner has been studying bugs for 25 years, and the field is definitely growing. Well, approximately 10 years ago, the estimate of total insect species in the world was maybe two to three million. More recently, there's been work done in the rainforest with fogging the treetops and a canopy, and this has now raised the estimate of total world insect species to 30 to 40 million. Insects usually go unnoticed or are shunned altogether. They're maligned for spreading infection, destroying crops, and otherwise making life miserable. But without carnivorous insects and their appetites, the carcasses of dead animals would remain where they fell until bacteria consumed them. Not everyone finds bugs distasteful. Studying insects and other so-called lower life forms is nothing new. It's just becoming more widely practiced and providing better information. Forensic entomologist Jason Bird believes insects have a lot to teach us. Forensic entomology has been around since uh, 13th century China. Uh, it's been used extensively in uh, Europe and Australia, and it's uh, apparently it's pretty slow to catch on in the United States. Uh, it's really only had its current widespread use since uh, the 1950s, and just within the past 10 years alone, it has enjoyed a resurgence of popularity. Despite its obvious benefit to criminal investigation, forensic entomology is not a field of study sought out as enthusiastically as medicine or law. The ranks of forensic entomologists are slim. At most, a few dozen insect specialists in the United States regularly assist with murder cases. People see bugs not as partners, but as pests. Unfortunately, most people treat insects as something creepy and something to recoil and be afraid from. And most of this is a cultural prejudice or just not understanding what insects are all about. I think anybody who takes the time to study insects and to learn how they live, learn the extremely interesting behaviors that they show, can't help but become interested in them if not enamored with them. 
the benefits can be many to those detectives willing to overcome their distaste for bugs. Insects can make or break an investigation. That's the message brought on this day by insect scientist Neil Haskell, who has come to Wilmington, North Carolina. His mission is simple, to introduce law enforcement to the exotic world of bugs and their ability to crack difficult cases. The ultimate goal is to acquaint the law enforcement folks, the crime scene uh, investigators and uh, coroners, medical examiners with the, first of all, the importance of uh, using entomological evidence in uh, death investigations. Second of all, to train those uh, investigators how to collect, recognize and collect uh, the proper specimens and then how to preserve it and how to uh, ship it and uh, uh, transfer, transfer it to a qualified forensic entomologist for uh, evaluation and analysis. Although insects can't communicate in a conventional sense, their behavior on a dead body can speak volumes to those who know how to listen. Haskell uses dead pigs as stand-ins for dead humans when teaching police officers and evidence technicians the finer points of forensic entomology. In his training sessions, Haskell tries to simulate the real world as best he can. He arranges the pigs as one might find a dead human, covered by brush, hidden out of sight. These pigs have been put out uh, to attract the carrion insects that are forever present in, uh, in most of our environments. And uh, it has been successful because we, we do know that under these carcasses, uh, we're going to be finding some fly larvae that have infested the, the carcasses. And this is what we would find on uh, human remains that have been out for a period of time. Haskell's class is no place for the squeamish. But the things his pupils see here are no worse than what they're likely to find in a real murder investigation. It's time for their next lesson, collecting maggots. We're collecting some of the maggots as preserved specimens. We're also collecting some of the maggots as live specimens. We uh, had the liver that we're going to be growing them on in, in what we call maggot motels. And today we're using liver, beef liver, and we put 15 or 20, 25 maggots in that and then close it up, place it in this, uh, in this can or container and then allow them to grow, monitor them daily or, or every two days to see how they're doing. And then, <clears throat> then we can, uh, eventually they'll grow to adults and uh, then we can make positive identification of those specimens. Female flies are the insect's first strike on a corpse. If something dies, they'll find it. When a female arrives on decomposing remains, she goes into an egg-laying frenzy. The maggots are the result of the attraction of the chemical smells that are coming from the body that attract the adult flies in. Now the flies uh, have developed uh, and evolved over uh, uh, centuries to select out this specific, very specific kind of food, the rotting tissues of, of dead animals. Not all the fly offspring will survive. But the mother has given her ravenous young a fighting chance by choosing a ready source of sustenance. This, way. We gotta come around from the other side. this female will deposit uh, anywhere from oh, 150 to maybe up to 400 eggs in a clutch, uh, seeking out sites of, of protection such as the nose, uh, nasal area, mouth, uh, and eyes. Uh, those eggs will then go through a period of time uh, when they will eventually hatch a few hours to uh, a day or two, depending on temperature. The eggs will hatch into first stage larvae, which will grow and develop for a few more hours, and then shed their skin and go through several more changes. As maggots grow, so do their appetites. During their first two stages, they never stop eating. The individual maggots form a large mass that eats and moves as one. And while they're in this maggot mass uh, uh, configuration, uh, uh, temperatures within this mass will <laughs> climb very, very high, uh, 15, even up to 20 degrees centigrade above 
the normal outside air temperature or ambient temperature. Back in the lab, Haskell examines the mass of maggots. The particular stage and rate of growth of the larvae will provide investigators with a good idea of how long a body has been left in the open. The maggots act as filters. They can be tested for chemicals and drugs they may have picked up from their host. For those of us who know how to listen, insects can be vocal witnesses to the circumstances of a person's death. In November 1987, residents of a middle-class Indianapolis suburb phoned police. They were worried that they hadn't seen their elderly male neighbor for a number of days. He lived there with his invalid sister and aunt. Police arrived at the house. When no one answered, they entered. The house was a complete mess. Investigators found refuse of all sorts in the kitchen. Unwashed dishes, uneaten meals, discarded silverware, and empty packages. Bags of decaying food moldered in the garage. Then police found the homeowner, collapsed on the living room floor, apparently dead for some time. Not certain what they were facing, investigators called for backup. As more detectives arrived, neighbors began to congregate. Nearly every inch of the house was covered with trash. Police wondered what kind of person could live like this. The officers cautiously inspected every room. The search quickly took a bizarre twist. What this? Gosh. Oh, yeah? Investigators were shocked to find the mummified remains of two women in a pair of back bedrooms. Since the cause of death wasn't readily apparent, police assumed murder. Sergeant Reggie Roney recalls the grisly discovery. We're treating this as a homicide scene because we don't know what has happened here. And uh, my first view of the body is, is there's no body. All that's left is clothing and, and it's kind of like a mummy laying there on the bed. And I look at it and I can see the little skull caps that the older women used to wear and uh, bed sheets and I can tell all the bodily fluids have gone see through the mattress and it's just a skeletal type mummy. The only evidence seemed to be an abundance of bugs, beetles mostly, found on the bodies of both women. Whatever happened here wasn't an ordinary death scene. It would take extraordinary means to sort it all out. Investigators on the scene of the triple deaths faced a double mystery. How did the victims die and how long had they been dead? Autopsies would probably answer the first question, but the second one seemed unsolvable. At the crime scene, detectives meticulously cataloged each piece of evidence, including several dead flies and the dried husks shed by beetles, called cast skins. Each insect type was a valuable clue, but investigators weren't certain how to read the evidence. They also gathered samples of an unusual brown stringy material found near both bodies. Baffled by what they found, they realized they needed the help of a forensic entomologist. They called on Neil Haskell. 
he met members of the Indiana University Medical Center forensic science team at the morgue for an autopsy. Obviously, we had uh, to determine how long these individuals had been there because in the in investigation it was important to pinpoint time of death. Obviously, who these, these individuals are, uh, when they died, and, and possibly where they died, and how they died. And so each one of the, the different forensic disciplines uh, was, was providing pieces of that puzzle together. For Haskell, that meant identifying the particular insect species that colonized each of the women's remains. Thank you. And for, uh, Haskell noted a curious difference between the two female mummies. One's face contained most of the original flesh, while the second did not. From the second body, Haskell collected numerous empty puparia, or casings. These, he knew, were left behind by juvenile blowflies as they hatched into adulthood. But the first set of mummified remains was marked only by dead beetles. Why the difference? Haskell knew that decomposing remains almost immediately attract egg-laying female flies. Okay, okay. Judging from the amount of flesh still on the body of one of the mummies, flies seem to have ignored it altogether. Insects are weather dependent. Their development is controlled by the seasons. Haskell suspected that weather had played a role. To gather more evidence, he visited the house where the bodies were discovered. In both bedrooms, he found beetle cast skins. But in one bedroom was an abundance of intact, dead beetles. In that room, he collected specimens of three different species. The blinds had been pulled down. They were down. But behind those blinds, as, as I raised the blinds and searched the room, uh, there were, were uh, a couple hundred uh, adult dried beetles that had, had come from the body and had tried to reach the out of doors and gone to the windows and could get no further. And so then they died on the window sills. Haskell was still puzzled by the pencil shaving like substance found next to the dead beetles on the woman's body. At first, he theorized it was a kind of fungus. Then he remembered that a similar material had been found on a body in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1962. In his laboratory, Haskell put the substance under a microscope. As others had in the Copenhagen case, he identified the substance as beetle feces excreted by the larvae. The feces is associated with remains that have been mummified for long periods. As detectives continued their search of the home, they found a diary written by the ant. In her last entry, dated October 5, 1977, the ant reported that her health was failing, and so was the health of her niece. Neither, the ant wrote, had long to live. This information helped Haskell with his investigation. He theorized that the ant, whose remains were more skeletonized than her niece's, must have died when the flies were still active. That would have been no later than autumn. The ant's body had less flesh because the flies arrived during warmer weather laid their eggs, and their larvae had cleaned the skeleton. Haskell concluded that the ant, the older of the pair, died first in October 1977. The niece likely would have died in late December 1977, or perhaps early January 1978. The niece's body was better preserved because her death came in the coldest part of the year. There simply were no egg-laying flies around to be attracted to the chemical signals emanating from her remains. Make it up, move.
moved in the middle of the night. <laughs> the mystery of when the women died was solved. Other questions persisted. Why were the women kept in the house for 10 years after they died? Police could only speculate on the details of their lives. The diary helped fill in some of the missing pieces. The aunt had fallen in the backyard and broken her hip. She could no longer get around. Soon after the aunt was injured, her niece also broke her hip. The man looked after both women around the clock as their health continued to fail. After his aunt died, the man decided to keep her in the house rather than alert anyone to her passing. Shortly after, his sister died. He decided to keep her death a secret as well. He managed to maintain the charade for 10 years. To avoid being discovered, he always ordered enough groceries for three people. He refused to allow the delivery person to bring them into the house for fear the smell would be noticed. He insisted that the bags be slipped under the garage door. That explained the sacks of uneaten food rotting in the garage. As the weather warmed, the odors from the bodies surely would have been difficult to live with. To the neighbors, the man was friendly enough but he kept them at arm's length. When asked about the health of his aunt or sister, he'd be noncommittal. Sometimes he'd complain that the women were keeping him up all night or give details of their failing health. Remarkably, the neighbors kept their distance and never set foot in his home. As detectives investigated further, the final piece of the puzzle fell into place. They discovered that the man received at least $140,000 in fraudulent social security checks after the women's deaths. But that may have only been part of the reason. Perhaps the decision to keep the bodies was motivated more by compassion than greed. He had cared for them so long and, and, and you know, looked at them and looked after them 24 hours on a daily, daily basis. Uh, I think that he just probably couldn't bring himself to, to, to uh, uh, give up his, his loved ones. No charges were ever filed in the case of the Indianapolis mummies. The trio's deaths were officially recorded as due to natural causes. Before they died, they named their church as the beneficiary of the estate. The social security money owed to the government was partially paid back by the sale of the property. The bugs had helped detectives solve the curious case of the Indianapolis mummies. However unusual, it was one investigation among hundreds for insect specialists like Neil Haskell. Haskell says that bugs are becoming powerful allies in an age when sophisticated technology is figuring more and more into criminal cases. One example is the analysis of human DNA found in the blood that bugs take from human bodies. The mosquito uh, is feed and it swells up, its abdomen swells, that's a, that's a human blood meal in there. And you can analyze that blood meal uh, for human DNA. And it works in, in uh, mosquitoes, bed bugs, fleas, and lice now. Tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous tool. The study of insects is the study of the great tenacity and variety of life. Yet modern science has much to learn about insect life, 
especially as it applies to investigating death. According to entomologist Lee Goff, many details are still unknown. We need to put uh, forensic entomology on a firmer statistical basis. Uh, right now, the statistical basis is just beginning to be developed, and we need to see more modeling in terms of what's going on with the corpses. So there's an awful lot of research. I think probably I've got more questions now than I had when I got into it 15 years ago. As methods improve, as more scientists enter the field and learn more about insect behavior, the value of forensic entomology will grow. Well, when I first started, actually, I'd go back to 15 years ago when I first became involved in forensic entomology. Uh, law enforcement agencies thought we were a little bit nuts and really were a little skeptical that we'd be able to give them anything that would be of use. Over the past 15 years, by working very diligently with the different agencies and different uh, groups of people, we've been able to convince them that, in fact, it is a very powerful uh, tool for use in their investigation. So I'd say now it's uh, very widely accepted. No matter how technical our world becomes, the simplest methods are sometimes the best. And sometimes the least likely sources are the most dependable. Slowly, homicide investigators are beginning to realize the invaluable contributions made by the smallest witnesses to murder. An elderly man is shot dead in front of his family at a July 4th celebration. No one knows where the bullet came from. How can police track down his killer? A charismatic leader of the Black Panthers is killed in a police raid. His supporters say he was assassinated. The police claim they shot him in self-defense. Can a forensic expert determine who is lying? A child dies in a drive-by shooting. Can a state-of-the-art computer link evidence from this crime to another and win a conviction? It takes a split second for a gun to deliver death. Solving the crime takes much longer, but with increasing speed, expertise, and accuracy, forensic detectives are zeroing in on their deadly target. In Bloomingdale, Illinois, a small town 40 miles northwest of Chicago, July 4th, 1989 began like any other Independence Day. Like people all across America, families and friends gathered to celebrate the country's birthday by relaxing and holding the traditional backyard barbecue. Kids amused themselves with sparklers while eagerly waiting for the sun to set and the town fireworks display to begin. On the picnic grounds, a carnival provided an endless array of diversions, something for everyone to enjoy. But for one Bloomingdale family, the celebration ended in tragedy. In a field near the picnic grounds, the family joined a crowd gathered to await the fireworks. The grandfather passed time playing with his grandchildren. Then, without warning, he tumbled out of his chair. His wife thought he had a heart attack. Two off-duty detectives happened to be picnicking with their own families nearby. They rushed to offer assistance. When they turned over the man's body, they found a bloody wound beneath his ribs, a bullet hole. This 64-year-old grandfather had been shot dead. Shock was followed almost immediately by mystification. No one had heard a shot or seen anything. A search of the field came up empty. No gun, not even a spent cartridge could be found. 
the killing was the most baffling case the Bloomingdale police had ever encountered. Who had shot the man and why? Unraveling the mystery, forging a link between victim and killer, would demand all the ingenuity forensic experts could muster. Lieutenant Richard Vaughn is the ballistics examiner at the DuPage County Sheriff's Department. As soon as an autopsy had been performed, the Bloomingdale police called him in. The coroner confirmed that a bullet had struck the victim on the right side, then penetrated beneath the rib cage, causing his death. He also recovered the bullet. Fortunately, it had not hit bone and was in near pristine condition. Vaughn's initial task was to try to establish what kind of gun had fired it, so he and detectives could begin to look for the gun and, ultimately, its owner. Under his scrutiny, the bullet's size and weight and any physical marks could provide vital information. The evidence bullet in this case, uh, the first question would be what caliber is it? Caliber is determined by the weight of the bullet and by the diameter of the bullet. Vaughn started by weighing the bullet on a digital balance. Then he measured it with an instrument called a micrometer. When the process was completed, he determined the bullet was a 44 caliber. It had come from one of the most powerful handguns on the market, a 44 Magnum revolver. Several companies manufacture such weapons. Vaughn had to determine the make and model of the one that shot the fatal bullet. He placed the bullet under a microscope and examined its rifling characteristics. All guns leave a series of spiral grooves on a bullet as it speeds down the barrel. The number of grooves, their width, and whether they twist to the left or right varies with the manufacturer. This particular bullet had six grooves and six lands, the raised regions in between. They spiraled along the bullet with a right-hand twist. Now Vaughn turned to a device called a measuring projection unit. It enabled him to accurately determine the widths of each land and groove. Armed with this information, Vaughn turned to a computer database called the General Rifling Characteristics File. Maintained by the FBI, it contains information about thousands of weapons. Feeding in the caliber, number, and width of lands and grooves, and the directional twist of the bullet enabled him to identify the probable make of the gun. We had a groove width measurement of 0.129 thousandths of an inch. When we then refer to the 44 Magnum caliber category, you will note that the probable make and model of firearm that could have fired the evidence bullet was a firearm manufactured by Sturm Ruger, and the model would be the Red Hawk model. Within two hours, Vaughn developed a vital piece of evidence. The gun was a Strum Ruger Red Hawk 44 Magnum. But a search of local gun shops turned up no record of any such weapon being sold. Vaughn decided the only way to trace the killer was to find where the bullet had been fired okay, from. Out with this we had... An ammunition manual told him that a Ruger Red Hawk 44 Magnum has a maximum range of about a mile and a half. But the chances of locating where the bullet had been fired in an area that large would be next to impossible. To reduce the search area, Vaughn went back to the site of the killing to reconstruct the incident. All that he required was a mannequin, a lawn chair, and a wooden dowel. He seated the mannequin in the same place and position as the victim. Then he inserted the dowel through its body in the precise angle of the bullet wound. The dowel rod now represents the actual trajectory of the bullet. Since we have an entrance wound here on the right side and the bullet was recovered on the left side, you'll note that the dowel rod is pointing in this direction here. We will now refer to this as the alleged flight path of the bullet. The dowel pointed roughly northwest. If Vaughn was right, that was the direction from which the bullet had been fired. Back in his lab, he began to map out the area where the police should concentrate their search. 
This is a Bloomingdale Township map, which I was able to pick up at the highway department, uh, which I took to the scene. And it demonstrates or depicts the search area. Uh, you'll note this area here is the open field in which the spectators were seated waiting for the 4th of July fireworks to occur in this area here. The decedent was seated in a chair here. Now, we had determined by a quadrant that our search area was going to be to the north and northwest. But from where in this search area had the bullet been fired? Vaughn's references told him the muzzle velocity of a Red Hawk is 1,200 feet per second. But from the 15-inch deep wound in the dead man, a medical examiner estimated the bullet slowed down to less than 700 feet per second when it hit. With the help of a computer ballistics expert, Vaughn calculated how far the bullet must have traveled for its velocity to have been reduced to this amount. Uh, we came to realize that the impact velocity being approximately uh, 450 feet to 700 feet per second, that we would have to concentrate our s search in an area between 500 yards and 700 yards. So our search area would have been in this span right here. So what we did is we actually established a cone of origin, if you will, where we would focus our search from this line depicted here to this roadway, which is depicted here. After narrowing the search area, Vaughn and police combed the neighborhoods between 500 and 700 yards northwest of the picnic grounds. They conducted door-to-door -door interviews, searching for any evidence that a large caliber gun had been fired. Eventually, they arrived at a residence on Lawrence Avenue. During a search of the backyard, they made a crucial discovery. In a corner was a 55-gallon drum perforated with holes. Vaughn felt they could have been made by 44 caliber bullets. The edges showed little sign of rust, suggesting they were new. Had they been made by the same magnum that killed the elderly man? To find out, Vaughn had to recover one of the bullets and compare it to the bullet from the dead man. He relied once again on dowels to point him in the right direction. With luck, they'd lead him to a bullet. We have uh, evidence that the shots uh, were fired at an angle where they entered a little bit higher than they exited. Um, you also note that the metal on this side, that there's an indentation here, that the actual metal folds inside, which is indicative of the, this being where the bullet entered. And on the other side, we have evidence of the bullet exiting where the metal fold is actually folding towards the outside. So this is indicative of the bullet exiting. So we're going to take this dowel rod here and we're going to reconstruct the trajectory. In other words, the flight path of the bullet from the time it struck the 55-gallon drum until it exits. Again, you can see the actual metal around the periphery of the hole and the fact that it's folded out is indicative that this is an exit. So this would demonstrate that this bullet continuing in a straight, straight flight path would most likely have hit the grass somewhere in here. So what we're going to have to do is focus our search on this area. We're going to have to conduct a grid search. Vaughn and detectives spread out to find a bullet. Despite their thoroughness, they found nothing. Perhaps the barrel had been moved since the shots were fired through it. If so, metal detectors would be required to search a larger area. Then one of the deputy sheriffs had an idea. Perhaps the shooters had been burning logs in the barrel while using it as a target. Maybe the bullets were in the nearby pile of ashes. He sifted through the cinders and found what he was looking for. If Richard Vaughn could prove the bullet came from the same gun that killed the elderly man, he'd have the break he needed. When the man died in a picnic ground in Bloomingdale, Illinois on July 4th, police had only two clues, the bullet recovered at autopsy and the wound it left behind. Now, ballistic examiner Richard Vaughn had a second bullet, found near the 55-gallon drum. A comparison of the bullets would tell him if they came from the same gun. 
Every Ruger Redhawk Magnum leaves similar rifling marks on a bullet. Six lands and grooves with a right-hand twist. But every gun also leaves its own unique individual signature on the bullets it fires, produced by tiny irregularities in the rifling. The bullet found in the drum was deformed by the impact, but Vaughn was still able to discern a series of distinguishing marks. They were enough to conclude it came from the same weapon that killed the victim. The net was closing in, but an important question remained. Could a bullet fired from the backyard travel unobstructed for nearly a half mile to the picnic grounds? Vaughn enlisted the help of an engineering firm to survey the bullet's likely path. They recorded ground elevations and the positions and heights of every house and tree between the Lawrence Avenue residence and the picnic grounds. Then they constructed a diagram. The red line here demonstrates the calculated trajectory of the fatal bullet. The dark line here demonstrates the terrain. We do have documented here the dwellings that fell within the line of the trajectory of the fatal bullet. Uh, what we were able to determine uh, was that this particular residence, for example, the bullet went directly to the right of it. But uh, this is, indicates where the barrel of the firearm was. Uh, this is the fence that was at the back of the property, of the suspect's property. And this is the area where the decedent was seated. On its half-mile journey to the picnic grounds were many potential obstacles. Amazingly, the bullet missed every one. But would it still possess enough power to kill once it got there? To make his case, Vaughn had to prove it could. He turned to wound ballistics expert Martin Fackler, who had devised a standardized way to test how far a bullet penetrates human flesh when traveling at various speeds. The depth of the wound depends on the velocity of the bullet. To simulate the penetrating power of a bullet after a half-mile flight, some gunpowder is removed to slow it down to between 400 and 700 feet per second. This is referred to as a bullet inertia puller, and we're going to use this to pull and separate the bullet from the cartridge case so that we are able to actually remove the gunpowder from the cartridge case. Now that the bullet has been separated... We Vaughn carefully tips out a measured amount of the gunpowder. It's a trial and error process. Empty out some powder, fire around. Measure the bullet's speed. If it's too high, remove a little more gunpowder. If it's too low, remove a little less from the next round. To ensure that the bullet impacts the block at the intended velocity, its speed is measured with an electronic timer. Uh, this is a chronograph. This is used to measure the speed of a moving projectile. It is nothing more than a timer, and the timer is started by the shadow of a bullet passing between these first two rods, and the timer is stopped by the shadow of a bullet passing between the second two rods. The Speed in feet per second of the projectile is then recorded in the front of the machine. Finally, when everything is set, the test bullet is fired into the gelatin. Firing in the hole. The bullet traveled 15 inches, almost identical to the depth of the fatal wound. What's more, like the bullet found in the victim, it had not deformed. Expands or mushrooms. The test proved that the bullet had enough power to kill the man from a half mile away. Further evidence that the shot had been fired from Lawrence Avenue. The results of Vaughn's test gave Assistant State's Attorney Joe Burkett grounds to serve a search warrant on Robert Logsdon, resident of the home where the drum was found. Logsdon admitted he and his girlfriend held a party on July 4th. Uh, but at first, he denied owning a handgun. As a convicted uh, felon, it was illegal for him to possess one. He lied about virtually everything until he was confronted with facts that were known to us that we had put, put in the warrant, and he ultimately confessed and implicated his girlfriend as well in the shooting. 
Under pressure from Burkett, Logsdon produced a 44 caliber Strum Ruger Red Hawk. He later confessed and revealed the events of his party. It had started ordinarily enough, a barbecue for a few close friends. Sometime in the afternoon, Logsdon had gone into the house to fetch his Ruger Red Hawk. A jug of water was placed on the 55-gallon drum as a target. Logsdon fired off five rounds. One hit the jug, but four missed and hit the drum instead. Then he handed the gun to his girlfriend, who shot missed the jug and drum completely. From Logsdon's statement, Vaughn determined that the girlfriend fired the fatal bullet. Because she was shorter than Logsdon, she tilted the gun higher. The increased angle gave the bullet a trajectory high enough to reach the picnic grounds. Logsdon pleaded guilty to unlawful use of a handgun, to possessing a stolen weapon, and to involuntary manslaughter. His girlfriend also admitted firing the gun and likewise pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Logsdon was sentenced to six years. His girlfriend received 90 days plus probation. It was really just a tremendously successful investigation because um, as with any murder or any homicide, uh, police, police officers and prosecutors don't take holidays. So we worked closely with the sheriff's office, the coroner's office, Bloomingdale Police Department, uh, Sergeant Vaughn and the crime lab, all, everybody did an excellent job. In Bloomingdale, victim and killer were completely unaware of each other's existence and were a half mile apart. It took the tools of forensic science and the dedication of law enforcement professionals and ballistics experts to bridge the gap. The Bloomingdale death was a tragic accident caused by carelessness and an astonishing twist of fate. Its randomness made it a challenge to solve. In Chicago, during the turbulent 1960s, an investigator struggled with a different challenge. A political activist lay dead. Was he killed in self-defense or assassinated? The bullet-riddled walls held the answer. December 4th, 1969, 4.45 a.m. 14 police officers, handpicked by Illinois State Attorney Edward Hanrahan, approached an apartment in Chicago's Oak Park area, the heart of the city's black ghetto. They were about to embark on what would become one of the most controversial events in Chicago's history. The first floor apartment was occupied by members of the Black Panther Party, a militant left-wing organization that preached social revolution. As the main group of police entered the front, a smaller force came in at the back. Fifteen minutes later, the tiny two-bedroom apartment was laced with 100 bullets. When the smoke cleared, two young Panthers were dead. Four more were injured, two of them seriously. Two policemen received superficial wounds. The raid yielded a cache of arms. 19 guns and boxes of ammunition. Among the dead was Fred Hampton, age 21, the charismatic leader of the Panthers' Illinois chapter. Black people need some peace. White people need some peace. And we are going to have to fight. We're going to have to struggle. We're going to have to struggle relentlessly to bring about some peace. Hampton was the 28th Black Panther killed by police in less than two years. The Black Panthers emerged in Oakland, California, a product of the 1960s social unrest. While black leaders such as Martin Luther King advocated civil disobedience and political action to advance civil rights, the Panthers seemed prepared to use violence if necessary. The December 4th raid quickly became a media event as the Panthers and the authorities gave radically different accounts of what happened. Hanrahan claimed the police were serving a legitimate search warrant when the Panthers started shooting. When the police officers announced their office, they were fired upon. 
In a film demonstration, the police gave their account of the raid. In this version, Panther Mark Clark was sitting in a chair in the living room. He fired a shotgun through the front door as police approached. Police then burst in and shot him dead. As more Panthers began shooting, the exchange escalated. There were three shots fired from the rear bedroom. They were directed directly at the back door uh, as I was coming in. I backed out again. According to police, when they entered Hampton's bedroom, they found him in bed, lying on his stomach. He opened fire with a 45 caliber automatic and a shotgun. In self-defense, they shot him twice in the head. But the Black Panthers told a different tale. The police burst in without warning, started shooting, and killed Mark Clark, who fired only after being fired upon. No other Panther used a weapon. More police stormed in from the back, found Fred Hampton asleep, and shot him twice in the head before he had a chance to wake up. Hampton's girlfriend was in bed with him when the raid began. Still half asleep. I looked up and I saw bullets coming from it looked like the front of the apartment from the kitchen area. And they were pigs were just shooting. Um, when he looked up, just looked up, he didn't say a word and he didn't move except for moving his head up. He laid his head back down to the side like that. He never said a word, and he never got about the bed. The Panthers were convinced that Fred Hampton was assassinated and that police had launched a full-scale cover-up. Panther lawyer Skip Andrew acted as their spokesman. Anyone who went through that apartment and examined the evidence that was remaining there could come to only one conclusion, and that is that Fred Hampton, 21 years old and a member of a militant, well-known militant group, was murdered in his bed, probably as he lay asleep. Police arrested the surviving Panthers and charged them with several offenses, including attempted murder. To defend the Panthers, their lawyers needed evidence to support their version of the raid. They turned to ballistics expert Herbert McDonnell. He seemed an unlikely choice. More than once, he had investigated gunfights between the police and black radical groups. He usually sided with the police. I understood it was a shootout, similar to the ones I'd investigated before in the Republic of New Africa and Fred Ahmed Evans and others. So I expected this would be another black militant group who were in the wrong and the police were in the right. As McDonald saw his role, it was to decide whether the police or the Panther account of the raid was nearer the truth. To determine this, he would have to reconstruct the raid from bullet holes and spent bullets in the apartment. It would take all of McDonald's skill to find out what happened. He entered the apartment through a small foyer, which led to the living room. Mark Clark, the first Panther to die, had been shot here. Beyond the living room were two bedrooms. Fred Hampton had died in the farther one. Finally, at the back lay the kitchen, through which the rear contingent of Hanrahan's force had entered. McDonald started his investigation in the living room. I spent ten and a half hours collecting evidence, taking photographs, and observing the trajectories of various bullets. I had never seen an area that had been so shot up as the living room. On one wall, the south wall, there were 45 bullet holes of various calibers. The larger ones were 45 caliber fired from a Thompson submachine gun. There were blasts from shotguns, and there were 30 caliber and 38. Having different sizes made it somewhat easy to establish which were fired from various weapons. Who had fired these shots, the Panthers or the police? McDonnell hoped his investigation would provide the answer. Come on in. As streams of sightseers Where? trooped through the apartment, McDonnell set to work, unpacking the simple tools of his trade, a camera, notebook, ruler, and a ball of string. 
Soon he made a curious request. I asked if I could have some straws brought in and some dowels. The panthers went out, some of them, and they came back very quickly with a big handful of straws and a bundle of dowels, small ones. After measuring the precise position of every hole in the living room wall, McDonald gently pushed the dowels and straws into them. By following the direction of a dowel, he could trace the path of a bullet. The straws protected the holes, ensuring that a dowel did not knock out plaster and destroy vital evidence. When he finished, the result was startling. All 45 bullets had been fired from the vicinity of the living room door. All must have come from the police as they burst into the room. When I began looking at the number of bullet holes, it became apparent that the vast majority seemed to be coming into the apartment rather than going out. The investigation seemed to be favoring the Panthers' version of the raid, but the police were quick to state their case. In an interview with the Chicago Tribune, Hanrahan produced a photograph of bullet holes in the molding around the back door. He called it irrefutable evidence that the Panthers had fired at the police as they entered from the rear of the apartment. Reporters studied the photos. One of the four pictures you gave the Tribune had two bullet holes on the right side of what was supposed to be the rear door. But when reporters inspected the apartment, they found the marks to be not holes, but nails. Hanrahan backpedaled. I have said that uh, we released the pictures. We have not characterized or described uh, the uh, conditions that they portray, other than to say that that is an accurate portrayal of that uh, particular object. Now the police changed their story. The panther bullets, they said, whistled through the open door. That is not what McDonnell found. The claims that there were bullets fired out at the police out the back door are unfounded. There is no way the bullets could not have hit a person in the door, and if they missed them, they would have struck a brick wall. McDonnell continued his investigation in the front bedroom, where he discovered bullets fired in the living room had passed through the wall. While in the bedroom, he noticed the door was also pierced by bullets. He counted 25 of them. The police had claimed panthers in the bedroom shot at them and refused to stop firing despite orders from officers. At first sight, the door seemed to confirm this part of the police's story. All the shots in the door came from the inside out exactly what would be expected if panthers in the bedroom had been shooting at the police. But there was a puzzle. None of those 25 shots hit an officer, nor was there any trace of them in the hallway beyond. But on closer examination, if those bullets were fired when the door was closed, as was claimed by the police, they would have struck the hall right across from that bedroom door. There was not one point of impact there. So having the dowels between the living room and that bedroom recessed, I could open the door all the way. And then all I had to do was to push the dowels from the living room side, and out of the 25 holes in the door, 25 were explained by the bullets coming from the living room when the door was wide open. When these shots had been fired, he concluded, the bedroom door was open roughly parallel to the bedroom wall. Bullets fired by the police in the living room passed through the wall, then continued on through the door. By now, the evidence was overwhelming. Of all the bullets fired, only one, a shotgun blast in the living room door, seemed to have been fired by a Black Panther. This was beginning to look like a very one-sided gunfight. There were at least 99 fired in. So when you have 99 to 1, it's not a shootout. It's a shoot-in. But what happened in the back bedroom when Hampton lost his life? Was he waiting in bed, ready to fire, as police claimed? Or was he asleep and murdered in cold blood by the police, as the Panthers insisted? 
the trajectory of the bullets through his skull might solve the riddle. On January 3rd, 1970, a federal grand jury ordered Hampton's body exhumed. Two earlier autopsies had given conflicting results. One, conducted by the Cook County coroner, reported that the two bullets in his head came from opposite directions. That suggested he was awake and moving. Hampton's relatives arranged a second one by a private pathologist. He found that both bullets had struck from the right and traveled on roughly parallel paths, suggesting Hampton was lying down. The new autopsy confirmed the second one regarding the trajectory. Both shots had entered Hampton's head from the right. The findings supported the Black Panther's claim that Hampton had been asleep, lying on his back with his head down. From the trajectory into the head of Fred Hampton, both shots were fired in nearly parallel trajectories which projected back to the doorway. So if one policeman came in and fired a shot, uh, Fred would have still been lying in that position when the second person came in with a different caliber and fired a second shot at what probably was either a dead or dying person. McDonald's meticulous investigation and the autopsy supported the Panther version of events. It looked as if the police had indeed assassinated Fred Hampton. But the most crucial question had not yet been answered. Did the Panthers or the police fire first? If the Panthers had started the shooting, even if they had fired just a single shot, the police could maintain they shot back only in self-defense. To answer this question, McDonnell performed his most dazzling piece of detective work. The gunfight evidently had started as the police stormed the living room. McDonnell found that the living room door contained two bullet holes. His examination of powder marks and wood splinters established that one bullet came from outside, from a police 38 revolver. He recovered the bullet from the living room wall. A second, larger hole likely came from Mark Clark's shotgun. After blasting a hole in the door panel, the slug had gone through a wall and ended up in the stairwell outside the apartment. McDonnell had an idea. By figuring out how far the door was open when the 38 bullet and the shotgun slug passed through it, he might be able to tell who shot first. He traced the bullet's paths as they flew through the door. He knew that, by their own admission, the police had forced open the door as the raid began. He threaded a string through the 38 caliber hole in the door to the 38 hole in the wall. Then he adjusted the door until the string was straight. The door was barely ajar. Next, he ran a line from the slug hole in the stairwell through the hole in the door and then to Mark Clark's chair. This time, when the string was pulled straight, the door was three quarters open. Through his experiments, McDonnell pieced together the scenario. As police pushed open the door at the start of the raid, they fired the 38. As it swung open further, a Panther shotgun went off. That was the only evidence of any shot being fired out. McDonald's conclusion was clear. The police fired first. According to McDonald's findings, the police broke in, firing a 38 caliber pistol as they slammed open the living room door. A Panther, presumably Mark Clark, returned the fire. As the fusillade of police bullets poured into the apartment, Panthers fled to the second bedroom, where they tried in vain to awaken Fred Hampton. When the police reached the bedroom, they shot Hampton twice in the head. In court, charges against the surviving seven Black Panthers were eventually dropped. No indictments were ever handed down against State Attorney Hanrahan or the 14 officers involved in the raid. But Hanrahan's credibility had been tarnished and his political career was ruined. Twelve years later, in a civil suit brought by the Panther survivors, the raiders were found liable 
and the city ordered to pay $1.8 million in damages. McDonald's detailed investigation helped to tip the scales and ensure that in the end, justice was done. It's been 30 years since Fred Hampton's death, but today, crime solving takes as much tenacity and ingenuity as ever. Investigators are finding a new ally in the computer. It's proving time and again that a criminal's past can catch up with him. On March 8, 1996, a young boy was spending the evening as any 12-year-old would when tragedy struck. A gang war simmered on the streets of his New Orleans neighborhood. The boy became a casualty of that war, a bullet in his head from a senseless drive-by shooting. Within minutes, police and paramedics were on the scene. They rushed to save the boy's life, but from the start, the prognosis looked grim. Homicide detectives from the New Orleans Police Department began interviewing eyewitnesses. Two men who had run for safety when the drive-by occurred returned to the scene. One of them was the victim's uncle. The men admitted to police that they were the intended victims. They recognized the car and identified the trigger man as Kevin Jordan, a gang member and drug dealer. Meanwhile, the child was taken to the hospital. 15 hours later, he died. As the search for Kevin Jordan started, Sergeant Michael Rice and John Treadaway, firearms examiner for the New Orleans police, began their own quest. Two bullets had been found at the crime scene, and a third had been recovered from the little boy. Could they link those bullets to a gun, and then link that gun to the killer? Uh, the bullet was placed in our evidence room and it was delivered to the firearm section for me to examine. But examining the bullet, I found that it was a 38 caliber having a six right rifling twist. Most drive-by shootings involve semi-automatic handguns, but this bullet was fired from a revolver. So I was able to inform the detective bureau that the gun that was used was uh, a 38 caliber revolver. But were all three bullets fired from the same 38? <laughs> to find out, Treadaway had to compare the fine details of each one. So, do you see how pronounced this is? If you look up on the monitor in the yes. groove, uh -huh. you can see about uh, two thirds of the way down, it's a good match. It notches on the following land and the following groove. This is a, this no is doubt. a hit, no okay. doubt at all. This is a, both, both bullets fired from the same weapon, no doubt. Okay. I think this is what they needed. Now, detectives in the field knew that only a single 38 revolver had been used. Until they found it, there was little more that Treadaway could do. Open the door, please! Whoa, man. Whoa, man. The detectives, man? meanwhile, learned the name of the driver. The man, the man, he was somebody. Henry Talley. The they also man, found man, out man. he owned a 38 caliber revolver. On March 16th, they arrived at Tally's home, armed with search warrants. A search turned up drug paraphernalia, marijuana, crack cocaine, and three guns, including his 38 caliber revolver. He was taken in for questioning. Tally's weapons were confiscated and sent to Treadaway at the ballistics laboratory. Could he tie the 38 revolver to the bullet that killed the boy? If so, the police could build a solid case against Tally and the alleged trigger man, Kevin Jordan, who had already been arrested on suspicion of murder. The first order of business was testing for fingerprints. Had Tally or Jordan last fired the gun and left prints on the trigger? Timothy Susano, a fingerprint expert with New Orleans Police Department, demonstrates how he finds them. Latent fingerprints, prints invisible to the naked eye, are developed in a two-stage process. 
the first involves fumigating with super glue. Molecules of the glue will stick to a print. Then you want to take your liquid super glue and pour it into the lumen dish. Next, I'm going to place the lumen dish onto a hot plate that's located inside this tank. That's going to heat the super glue and accelerate the fuming process. Within an hour, the gun is cooked. Now it's ready for the second stage of the test. It's washed with a fluorescent dye. If any prints exist, the dye will adhere to them and become visible under the ultraviolet light source. Unfortunately, none showed up on the 38 found at Tally's residence. The test could not help pin the shooting on Tally or Jordan. Still, the test is often worth performing. Sometimes it can yield dramatic results. This is an example of a uh, partial latent fingerprint that was developed on the trigger guard of a weapon that was used in a murder. As you can see, the partial fingerprint right here, that's on the front part of the trigger guard, which is located right here. To establish a connection between Tally's gun and the fatal bullet, Treadaway needed to inspect a bullet shot from the gun. In this room is our ballistic tank that we test fire our weapons in. This is Officer Gwen Serpass. He's going to test fire these weapons. We're going to test fire this uh, 38 first. Uh, before we do anything with it, uh, we normally like to check to make sure that the weapon is functional. Uh, make, we make sure that there are no obstructions in the barrel and uh, all the parts on the weapon are in place. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and load it. We need to put some ear protection on, uh, it gets a little loud in here. The gun is fired into an 800 gallon tank of water, informally called the hot tub. Water halts the bullet without distorting its shape or marking its surface. Once the weapon's fired, I then re uh, unload the weapon, remove the spent casings. The bullet retrieval system is simple but effective. A broom handle and a lump of silly putty. Once the bullet was recovered, its markings were examined and compared with bullets found at the crime scene. The match was undeniable. So I performed my test fire and examined the bullet, the test bullet, under the microscope with the three bullets that I received previously and determined that that gun had fired those three bullets. Tally's gun had indeed shot the little boy. Both Tally and Jordan were convicted felons, and by now the New Orleans police had enough evidence to charge Jordan with murder. But they suspected that the guns found in Tally's house had been used in other crimes. Could a new computer system implicate Tally in past crimes? When the 12-year-old boy died in a drive-by shooting in 1996, New Orleans police had a brand new crime-solving tool available. Earlier that year, they installed the Integrated Ballistic Identification System, or IBIS. It dramatically speeds up the time it takes to match bullets from crime scenes to guns confiscated by police. Sergeant Michael Rice runs the IBIS operation. For him, it's a vast improvement from the old method. We would go and physically get these guns and test fire them and examine them on the uh, microscope. Well, right now, uh, with, with our IBIS system, we can now simply, as a matter of routine, test fire these weapons and put them into IBIS. This image will then be correlated and uh, uh, checked against all of our current database. And if this gun had been used in a crime, we will know about it uh, in, in a very short period of time, perhaps within the hour. At the heart of IBIS is a sophisticated computer program linked to an elaborate microscope. Attached to the microscope are two tiny video cameras. 
When a test bullet is placed under one of the cameras, its magnified image appears on the screen. Greg McRae is one of the New Orleans detectives trained to use the new system. We have the uh, projectile, the bullet itself, mounted on a little fixture with the information recorded on it. Uh, it's glued on here. We're going to mount it to the machine, rotate it, and lock it in. At the flip of a switch, the cradle begins to move turning the bullet through one complete revolution, scanning an image of the bullet into the computer. As you can see, you see striations, uh, you see groovings, you see markings. As we move it down, we'll take a picture of it. Uh, the machine digitizes this picture as it takes it. Now, when we process it, it is, the picture is taken and then processed digitally from this machine into the next machine, the next computer, which will in turn correlate it. Built into IBIS is a program designed to scan each image for its distinctive pattern of marks or lines. Having picked it out, the program searches through its database looking for other images of bullets that match. Within less than a minute, it can scrutinize thousands of bullets a task that would take a ballistics expert like John Treadaway years to perform. This part of IBIS is called bulletproof. A second subsystem, Brass Catcher, enables him to scan and match spent shells. The casing, which is the other section of the bullet, would be put in this area here, and locked in here and secured. This particular uh, microscope will take a picture with the camera mounted up here of the back end, or I should say the breech face of that casing, the breech face and also the firing pin which is in this area right here. Now the computer records the shell's distinctive features, the positions and shapes of indentations left by the firing pin and tiny gouges left as it's ejected from the weapon. The operation is completed in two to three minutes. IBIS had been installed less than a month when a bullet from the 38 revolver that killed the 12-year-old boy was entered into it. There were no hits, no matches with the thousands of other bullets in the computer's database. But the system's real power was demonstrated with bullets test fired from a second gun, a 45 caliber automatic found in Henry Talley's apartment. The firing pin, which we're looking at, if you look very closely, you can see this duck image right here, uh, center in the firing pin itself. But this is very clear. We knew from looking at the screen that the probability of a match was, was very, very high. Ibis made a hit, implicating Henry Talley in another unsolved drive-by shooting. It was enough to strengthen the case against him regarding the death of the child. IBIS had proved itself on its first case. Prior to IBIS, this case would have probably been unsolved. It would have never, been, never picked up any additional follow-up unless there was a specific reason for it. We have um, uncovered and linked uh, uh, many, many cases involving uh, homicides as well as uh, shootings here in the city. And we made those links and those uh, correlations and, and tied them all together by simply what Greg's doing right now. And uh, we're kind of proud of what we do here, and um, I, would, I would not want to be without Ibis today. The death of the 12-year-old boy was solved partly by traditional ballistics work. But without the Ibis computer system, police would never have connected Tally's weapons to another crime that might have otherwise gone unsolved. Both Kevin Jordan and Henry Talley were convicted of first-degree murder and are now serving life sentences. By developing new ways to trace bullets to guns and guns to criminals, forensic detectives are increasingly able to turn a criminal's own ammunition against him. So long as there's a bullet, there's a clue. And so long as there's a clue, there's a chance to catch a killer.
Cleveland woman is killed in her home. Can 40-year-old evidence absolve a dead man of guilt? A stormy argument ends with a gunshot. To investigators, the situation screams murder until years later when forensics throws new light on it. Two homicides, one suspect. But the evidence needed to make the case was buried long ago. Will an exhumation put the final nail in the killer's coffin? At a murder scene, police must wring the full meaning from every available clue. But when the evidence is inadequate, detectives must return to the victim to make their grave discoveries. In 1998, a breakthrough in DNA analysis helped solve a 40-year-old murder case. At sunrise on the morning of July 4, 1954, Dr. Sam Shepard slowly came to on the Bay Village, Ohio shore of Lake Erie. The events of the pre-dawn hours flooded back to him like a nightmare. Fearing the worst, he staggered into the lakefront home he shared with his wife, Marilyn, and their young son, Sam. There, in the bedroom, his wife lay brutally beaten to death. She had been four months pregnant. Dr. Shepard told police he was awakened on the downstairs couch by his wife's panicked cries. When Shepard rushed to help her, he was attacked by a tall intruder. The resulting fistfight ranged from room to room and ultimately spilled onto the beach. There, the doctor was dealt a knockout blow to the neck. A bag of the Shepard's jewelry was found near the house, suggesting that the couple had interrupted a burglary. But the police work was soon overshadowed by rampant speculation. In the rush to justice, the shadowy intruder was forgotten. Sam Shepard became the only suspect. But a few people refused to believe Shepard was guilty and were determined to prove his innocence decades later. In the early 1990s, Cleveland attorney Terry Gilbert began studying the case and felt that Shepard was railroaded by a cursory look at the evidence. Dr. Sam Gerber, the coroner, had concluded within an hour or two after being at the crime scene that they had their man and it was Dr. Shepard. It was a death by domestic homicide. A trail of nearly 60 drops of blood led through the house. These were checked to ascertain they were human, but nothing more could be done with them. Forensic DNA analysis was 30 years away. Some of the bloodstains on the cellar stairs were overlooked for decades. Since Dr. Shepard had no open wounds, police assumed this blood trail fell from the murder weapon clutched in his hand. Forced entry marks on the door to the basement were never entered as evidence. Despite obvious signs an intruder had penetrated the house, Dr. Shepard was arrested for killing his wife. The coroner staged a public inquest. Dr. Shepard was grilled on live television for five hours without his attorney. The media grabbed hold of it and sensationalized this murder. Uh, the Cleveland Press through editor Louis Seltzer uh, every day ran articles about solving the Shepard case. Why is Dr. Shepard not indicted? Why is he not in jail? Cartoons showing him running through the house with a, some kind of a murder weapon dripping blood. Local officials hurried to close the high-profile case. 
The trial began just two months after Shepard's arrest. The coroner testified that the blood found throughout the house was human. It was assumed that it came from the victim. The prosecution argued that the doctor had faked his own neck injury. The jewelry bag was also presented as phony evidence of burglary. It was just a complete travesty of justice in terms of how that trial uh, emerged during that time. And uh, he was convicted. It was a foregone conclusion. He did not have a chance. We, the jury in this case, being duly impaneled and sworn, do find the defendant, Sam H. Shepard, not guilty of murder in the first degree, but guilty of murder in the second degree. Dr. Shepard was sentenced to 35 years in prison. But his family challenged the verdict, refusing to give up. A month after the conviction, they brought in forensic expert Leland Kirk to examine the blood spatters in the house. His analysis of several stains in the bedroom undermined the state's argument. Two blood stains larger than the spatters in the bedroom stood out to investigators. Their size and round shape suggested a puncture wound. The victim may have bitten her attacker. In Kirk's view, evidence strongly indicated a third person was at the scene. But the court wouldn't hear a word of it. In 1959, five years after the murder, the case took a strange twist. Cleveland handyman Richard Eberling was arrested for robbing a home where he worked. And police found among his spoils one of Marilyn Shepard's diamond rings. At his interrogation, Eberling, who resembled the man Shepard and witnesses described, unwittingly volunteered some incriminating information. He said he had cut himself at the Shepard's house the week of the murder, which would explain any strange blood found there. But he couldn't have known that investigators had questioned the bloodstains. It sounded like a killer's alibi. Even so, the county prosecutor refused to look at this new evidence. How much does it cost you? On July 16, 1964, a federal district court ruled that Shepard was denied a fair trial. After serving 10 years in prison, he was released and granted a retrial. Evidence that was ignored, misread, or suppressed would finally be seen. For his second trial in 1966, two years after his release, Dr. Shepard had rising legal star F. Lee Bailey handling his defense. Well, how do you explain his conviction in the first place? Uh, it was a result, according to Judge Weinman, and in my opinion, of mass hysteria generated by an overzealous press. So you in on the case at the beginning? No, I've only been a lawyer for four years. He's been in jail for 10. Bailey eroded the prosecution's case point by point. After years of neglect, the forced entry marks on the cellar door were entered as evidence. Bailey also argued that traces of a possible intruder were lost when the victim's body was prematurely washed by the coroner. Finally, a doctor testified that the fractured vertebra in Shepard's neck could not have been self-inflicted. Twelve years after the murder, the focus of the case switched to the mysterious intruder. In the retrial of convicted killer Sam Shepard, the discoveries of forensic expert Leland Kirk were finally going to be heard. Kirk testified that one blood drop on the closet door came from a puncture wound. The victim had died of blunt trauma, ruling her out as the source of the stain. But a re-examination of the autopsy record showed that her teeth had all the signs of inflicting a single powerful bite just before she died. Dr. Shepard showed no such wound. After a dozen years, the phantom attacker was taking on human form. Kirk's road to the truth was a trail of blood. Any forensic scientist even then would have told you that blood, as soon as it hits the air, 
dries and coagulates. The blood could not have dripped from a weapon long enough to have made the trail. These were all of equal size, which indicates that it came from an oozing wound. And none of this was looked into in 1954. Though the victim was forever silenced, the evidence was speaking out. The second trial lasted three weeks. F. Lee Bailey had stirred a reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury. On November 16, 1966, Sam Shepard was acquitted of killing his wife. But no one reopened the investigation into who had committed the murder. Potential suspects like Richard Eberling continued to be ignored. There was one reason. Many still felt Shepard was the killer, but that he'd been released on technicalities. Though the bloodstains gave him his freedom, they still smeared his reputation. He couldn't revive his medical practice. Just six years after his release, and after a failed second marriage, Dr. Shepard died of the effects of alcoholism. Through all the turmoil, Dr. Shepard's surviving son, Sam, lived quietly out of the spotlight. But in 1989, Richard Eberling, the Cleveland handyman and burglar, wrote to him from prison. Eberling was jailed for forging a woman's will and then beating her to death for the million dollar inheritance. Sam met with Eberling. The convict shared little known facts about the Shepard case. Sam wanted another trial to prove that Eberling was Marilyn Shepard's killer. At this point, Terry Gilbert sued the state of Ohio for Dr. Shepard's wrongful imprisonment. After his release, Shepard had sought no damages for the loss of his freedom. Forty years after the crime, his family hoped to prove the doctor's innocence by unlocking the secrets hidden in a drop of blood. The bloodstain evidence was passed to Dr. Mohammed Tahir, DNA analyst at the Indianapolis Marion County Forensic Services Agency. And the actual challenge was not the DNA analysis because this work we do every day. Uh, and the only challenge in this case was because the evidence was very minimum, very old. For comparison, Dr. Tahir needed a standard DNA profile from both the victim and Dr. Shepard. This way, if he found a third genetic profile in the decades-old bloodstains, he would know it belonged to the intruder. Dr. Tahir found a clean DNA profile for the victim in hairs plucked from her deathbed 40 years before. Though Shepard had died 18 years after his wife, a sample of his DNA seemed as elusive as the killer. Without this forensic key, the case to clear Dr. Shepard's name was stalled. Then the doctor's son thought he had a first-class source of his father's genetic material. He presented some love letters that his father had sent his mother when they were courting in 1943. Dr. Shepard's DNA might still be in the saliva mixed with the glue on the envelopes and stamps. But over the decades, the envelopes had been handled by too many people. Any DNA found on them was tainted and unusable. Once again, the case bogged down. There was still one place left to search for the doctor's DNA, his grave. Hounded in life, even death could offer Shepard no peace. In 1996, an order for his exhumation was granted. On the headstone were the letters VQP, standing for the Latin meaning, he who endures, conquers. Perhaps after nearly half a century, Dr. Shepard would finally be vindicated. Dr. Tahir was able to extract a completely clean DNA profile from one of Shepard's teeth after 24 years in the grave. But for comparison, he needed evidence taken from the crime scene. 
Dr. Tahir performed DNA tests on the bloody pants Shepard had worn the night of the murder. While he waited for those results, he processed two other vital clues. The first was the mysterious blood drop that Dr. Kirk had collected from the closet door back in 1955. The second was a blood-stained wood chip Sam had salvaged from a cellar stair tread before his childhood home was torn down in 1993. The results of Dr. Tahir's analysis became the new backbone of the case. There was a third person's DNA in the stains, not Dr. Shepard's and not the victim's. The mysterious intruder was no longer a product of Shepard's imagination. He was flesh and blood. But who was the third man? Attorney Terry Gilbert thought he knew where to begin his search. The imprisoned Richard Everling was required to give a sample of his blood for comparison. Dr. Tahir found that the convict's DNA could not be excluded from the blood stain on the wood chip or on the pants. The test results were 16,000 to 1 in favor that the strange blood stain in the house was Everling's. But those odds weren't good enough. The courts require a certainty of millions to 1 for a conviction. And when Everling heard his DNA was linked to the bloody stair, he reminded investigators of his alibi, that he had cut his hand at the shepherd's home shortly before the murder. Forty years after the fact, Everling knew there was no one to dispute his story. Because the DNA evidence was inconclusive, the truth about the murder might never come out. Time was conspiring to hide the killer's name. Many people involved in the case had long since died. A private detective agency volunteered to locate any surviving witnesses. After months of searching, they found Vern Lund and Ed Wilbert, two other Cleveland handymen who had known Richard Everling. They remembered that Marilyn Shepard had once caught Everling robbing her home. When the victim was murdered, they knew Everling had the motive. And this prompted one more recollection. Everling was out sick the week before the murder. He could not have bled at the Shepard's house as he claimed. Everling's alibi was shattered. When all the evidence was held up to the light, the events of that tragic night so long ago came into focus. The victim screamed when she found an intruder in her room. Dr. Shepard rushed to her aid, but was knocked unconscious. The intruder tried to finish ransacking the house, bleeding from a wound all the while. When Shepard accosted the killer again, the fight carried on to the beach. There, the doctor was struck so hard, a vertebra was fractured. But broken bones mean little compared to broken lives. It took forensic science 42 years to put the pieces back together. The forensic evidence that we uncovered in 96 was approximately 100 pieces of evidence. It excludes Dr. Shepard as the attacker and points to a very likely suspect named Richard Eberling. Eberling has denied that he's the killer, but in interviews over and over again, he has said things about I, I the case uh, that uh, only the uh, murderer would say. And this is an open case. It's still unsolved, technically. With each new clue, Eberling's shadow cast a longer pall over the case. But he died in July 1998 keeping his secrets forever. Forensic evidence is only as revealing as the experts who study it. The positive identity of Marilyn Shepard's killer remains a mystery. But thanks to a clear-eyed look at the clues, 
At least Dr. Shepard was able to convince his son of his innocence from beyond the grave. Assumptions at the crime scene can shape or distort an investigation. To clear a suspect, investigators must first believe he's innocent and then prove it scientifically. On July 6, 1984, the Platte County, Wyoming Sheriff's Office received a frantic call from Martin Frias. In a mix of Spanish and English, he told police that there had been a shooting. He could not give clear directions to the scene. Since Frias and the officers both knew a certain cafe in neighboring Wheatland, they met there. Frias guided officers to the trailer he shared with his girlfriend, Ernestine Perea. A grim scene awaited them inside. Perea's body lay face up on the floor. She had a wound in her abdomen. Frias's 300 Magnum rifle lay close beside her. Police found two bullet fragments lodged in the blood-spattered wall behind the body. Frias said he'd heard a muffled thump before he went to bed. Thinking it was merely Perea hurling shoes in one of her temper tantrums, he went to sleep. Hours later, when Frias awoke, he discovered the truth. His stormy relationship was over. Suicide was the initial ruling. After detectives interviewed Frias, he was released. Then a coroner examined the victim's remains more closely. The bullet wound in the lumbar region was small, like an entry wound. Police felt it was impossible for the victim to shoot herself in the back with a rifle. All the clues now pointed to homicide. But not everyone was convinced that Frias was a murderer. Four days after the death of Ernestine Perea, Martin Frias was arrested and charged with his girlfriend's murder. Frias's attorney, Robert Moxley, believed in his client's innocence from the beginning. When she was killed and they didn't have the scenario of her being shot in the back pat in their minds yet, they turned him loose. Uh, he had no real ties to the community. He'd been there a long time, but he was an illegal alien from Mexico. He didn't leave. He could have just disappeared and never been seen again. But at trial, the state's forensic evidence was more compelling than Frias's cooperation with police. It even outweighed the fact that though Frias had a severely injured arm, he had somehow managed to load, cock, and fire an unwieldy weapon that required two good hands. And given Frias's injury, the victim could have defended herself. But none of this mattered at the trial. According to the state's forensic tests, the victim's blouse showed no gunshot residue. Clearly, she had been shot from a distance. A medical examiner confirmed that the clean-edged wound in the victim's back marked where the fatal bullet had struck her. According to the medical examiner, the bullet had then passed through her body, fragmented, and exited her abdomen, leaving a much larger wound with uneven edges. To police, the conclusion was obvious. And so it was a circumstantial evidence case. If she was shot in the back, and if he was there, if his fingerprints were on the gun, well, then they could make a case that he had done it. The jury agreed. Martin Frias was convicted of the second-degree murder of Ernestine Perea. 
he was sentenced to 25 to 35 years in prison. Moxley appealed the verdict. He believed the forensic evidence had not been fairly explored. Wyoming law had not allowed him to call his own experts in the case. He'd had to use the same experts as the prosecution. At the time, the public defenders were required to rely on the state crime lab to be their neutral expert while they were still the neutral expert, quote unquote, that was making the prosecution case for the prosecution. Moxley felt this biased the analysis of the evidence against the defendant. Over the next year and a half, he and his assistant, Walter Carroll, fought their way through the courts to have Martin Frias retried. In order to make the case for retrial, Moxley brought on the best experts in the business. He had the victim's wound evidence re-examined by Dr. Vincent DeMaio, the chief medical examiner of Bexar County, Texas. Dr. DeMaio was the foremost expert on high-velocity rifle gunshot wounds. And I found out that he was going to be lecturing in Cheyenne. So I jumped in my car and went to his hotel in Cheyenne and cornered him with these autopsy photos. He took really one look at those autopsy photos. He held them out like this, and he held them up to his nose, and he says, that's a contact wound. And that's about how long it took him to know that that's what we had. A contact wound results when a gun is fired with the muzzle pressed against the target. Dr. DeMaio's impromptu analysis of the photo bucked the state's evidence in the first trial. But to an expert, the explanation was simple. When the hot gases are propelling a bullet down the barrel of a gun, it is compressing the air in front of it. The last few inches of the bullet's travel outside the barrel is preceded by this air which is compressed so hard that it's like a knife and it goes in first, then the bullet goes in, then liters and liters and liters and liters of hot gas follow the bullet. This, is the button this hot gas had violently expanded the victim's abdominal cavity to the point of tearing her jeans and snapping off the top pants button. The state's original view of the evidence was backwards. The bullet first struck the abdomen not the back. Though it was still possible the victim had been murdered, a contact wound in her front recalled the original scenario. Ernestine Perea could have taken her own life, but only new tests would confirm this radical take on old evidence. The victim's remains had long since been buried, but police still had her autopsy x-rays and the blouse she'd worn when she died. When DeMaio's findings were presented to the Wyoming Supreme Court, the case was reopened. Martin Frias was granted a retrial. In preparation for the new trial, along with DeMaio, Moxley brought in Robert Lentz, director of the Rocky Mountain Instrumental Laboratories in Fort Collins, Colorado, to examine the case. Mr. Moxley had asked me for my opinion, too, as far as whether or not it was at all likely that the bullet had come into her backbone from the front or from the back. After all, it's impossible to shoot yourself in the back, or at least very difficult. And so he first asked me that. I looked at the x-rays and said, this simply doesn't seem right. But no side view x-rays of the victim's torso had been taken in the original autopsy and Lance couldn't conclusively tell from frontal x-rays which direction the bullet had traveled. For now, he had to focus on the blouse. With a stereo light microscope, Lance observed that the fabric around the bullet hole in the front of the blouse was scorched and melted. This indicated a point-blank discharge of the weapon, but from the front, not the back. Next, Lance studied the gunshot residue on the blouse. Its distribution would tell him whether or not the gun was fired at close range. When the muzzle is close to the target, the residue saturates a very small area. At longer range, the residue area expands, but starts to thin out. 
I tested the overall cloth using what's called rhodazonic acid. The rhodazonic acid is very useful to uh, give me a pattern of the gunshot residue so that I can make an estimate of what the firing distance was and to see whether or not there is more gunshot residue on the front of the shirt or on the back of the shirt. He placed acid-treated paper over the inside and outside of the large bullet hole in the front of the blouse. The hot iron made the acid turn any gunshot residue on the paper bright purple. The prosecution in the first trial had claimed the victim was shot at a distance. To Dr. Lance, the evidence told a different story. And this shows us very easily the pattern so that we could see that there was a great deal of gunshot residue in a very tight mark around the hole and relatively little, even a short distance away. Once again, the forensic evidence pointed to a very close range shooting. If the victim had been shot from the front, she had seen death's approach. The question remained whether she'd welcomed it. In the retrial of Martin Frias, forensic gunshot analyst Robert Lance was wiping the defendant's slate clean with the victim's own blouse. But more rigorous tests were still needed to confirm that the victim was shot from the front. No ordinary microscope would be up to the task. To find the truth, Lance placed samples of the blouse in a scanning electron microscope to analyze the gunshot residue more closely. He discovered that the concentration of the residue decreased as the microscope panned from the front of the blouse to the back. That suggested a frontal entrance wound. The new defense was almost ready. But Moxley wanted to build the strongest case possible for his client's second trial. A blood spatter expert proved that Perea was seated on the floor when she was struck from the front. Of the wall where the blood splatters were. A ballistics test proved that the slug had expended its energy before striking the spine, breaking up, and exiting the body, again suggesting front entry. Medical records showed that the victim had been hospitalized for attempted suicide several times in the past and Perea's fingerprints on the gun were oriented as if she'd held it upside down, thus bringing the trigger within reach. The new evidence was strong, but Moxley was determined to add the victim's own testimony to the new trial. We got the family's permission to exhume the body, and we uh, did another autopsy. We had Dr. Eckert come to participate in the autopsy and for the first time they did lateral x-rays. The original pathologist had not done x-rays except from the front and you couldn't tell the bullet direction from the x-rays. The side x-rays showed bullet fragments and fragments of vertebrae that had been pushed between the victim's spine and the skin of her back. Only a bullet speeding through from the front could have left this kind of damage in its wake. When all the parts of the puzzle were fitted together, a picture of the victim's last night became clear. After an argument with his girlfriend, Martin Frias fell asleep in another room. Anger, depression, and a high blood alcohol level drove Ernestine Perea to make a final suicide attempt. She sat on the floor with the rifle resting on her extended legs. But the instant her troubles ended was the very moment her boyfriend's nightmare began. We convincingly proved just exactly how Ernestine committed suicide. We showed the 
pathology evidence, we showed the blood splatter evidence, we showed the gunshot residue evidence. There weren't any questions to be answered by the time we were done with our forensic evidence. Open door, please. Ultimately, the new x-ray evidence from the victim's grave clinched the case. In Martin Frias's second trial, the jury needed only an hour and 45 minutes to find him not guilty. After serving two years and 10 days in prison for a crime he didn't commit, he was finally set free. Exhumations are an investigator's last resort. The forensic evidence taken from the grave can either acquit or convict. On the rainy night of October 19, 1983, a couple driving on a lonely road in St. Charles County, Missouri, were the first on the scene of a single vehicle accident. The car was abandoned, but the engine was still running. When the Good Samaritan tried to turn the car off, he found blood smears on the seat. Then he saw a woman lying in the shadows beneath the dashboard. She was barely breathing. Police from the St. Charles County Sheriff's Department noted the heavy odor of gasoline throughout the car. The threat of fire made them hurry to pull the victim to safety. When the woman's blonde wig slipped to one side, rescuers saw just how badly she was hurt. Detective Ed Copeland feared for her life. At that point, while I was down in the car, I could feel that the back of her head had uh, trauma to it, or it was, it just didn't feel right, um, like a skull should feel. As the woman was rushed to the hospital, the car's registration was traced. It belonged to Jim Williams, a successful electrical contractor. Police phoned Williams, then drove to his home to inform him of his wife's accident. They found him sitting in the rain, waiting for them. At the hospital, doctors told Williams and his youngest son that Sharon wouldn't survive her massive head injuries. Jim Williams signed the forms allowing his wife's removal from life support. She died later that day. Jim's friend, Joanne Notais, tried to console him. Then, three months after the accident, their roles were reversed when her own marriage hit the rocks. After a bitter quarrel, Joanne's husband, Walter Notais, a band singer, stormed out into the cold December night wearing only a blue warm-up suit. Hours passed, but he didn't come home. Joanne Notice told police he'd run off. She suspected he was having an affair. But Captain Wes Simcox of the St. Charles County Sheriff's Department said Walter Notice's absence didn't seem planned. It was extremely bad weather. It was very cold. There was snow on the ground. Uh, Walter was not dressed for uh, that type of weather, and she was concerned about his uh, well-being. Walter Notice didn't return that night. The next day, Joanne Notice and Jim Williams broke into her husband's briefcase, seeking clues to his whereabouts. Joanne Notice's suspicions were confirmed in living color. The briefcase held steamy photos of her husband in the arms of his backup singer. A group of friends was organized to search for Walter. Jim Williams volunteered to scout the parking lots at the airport. There he found Walter's car. He drove it back to the Notice house before he told police of the discovery. Joanne Notice was disturbed, and so was any trace evidence that might have been left in the vehicle. Though police appreciated Jim Williams' zeal, they were also suspicious of it. 
Captain Simcox felt that Jim Williams' kindness to the missing man's wife seemed to overreach the bounds of friendship. The evening after Walter's disappearance, uh, Jim stayed at Walter's home with Joanne. Um, that's something you just do not do, friend or not. Um, there were several other things where there had been relationships between Jim and Joanne, uh, neighbors saying that they'd had what appeared to be a love affair going. Defying the ugly rumors, Williams continued to aid his friend in her time of trouble. He helped her search the truck the band toured in. If Walter Noteice had deserted his wife, she'd need bank records or securities he might have stashed there. But in the search for money, Joanne came up empty-handed. In the search for Walter, the police had no better luck. New Year's Eve came and went, with Walter Noteice missing his band's best playing gig of the year. He needed the money. Police thought he would have shown up if he were able. None of Walter's friends or band members or family members could verify that, that in fact, uh, he had left the country or the state or had gone somewhere. So it was our opinion that, uh, that foul play was involved, but here again, we couldn't find anybody. Police stepped up the investigation of Jim Williams. They learned that just two weeks after Walter's disappearance, he was making plans to sell his house and move in with Joanne Noteis. Detectives questioned Jim Williams' children. His youngest son, Brett, still lived nearby. He told police he thought it odd when his father ordered a flower box built in the dead of winter at the house he was trying to sell. But the young man told police he had gotten an even more disturbing surprise. One night, shortly after the death of his mother, Brett Williams went out with his fiancée. His father and Joanne Noteice came along. Brett was upset to see his mother's favorite bracelet on Joanne's wrist. Jim Williams was getting on with his life at a breakneck pace. Even more suspicious, police learned that right after Walter Noteis disappeared, his wife began canceling his singing appearances. It seemed that no one expected Walter to make a return engagement. Okay, Mr. Williams, I'm just going to ask you a few questions about uh, the night of the 20th. In the disappearance of Walter Noteis, detectives questioned Jim Williams. Where he had been so helpful before, they suddenly found him reticent. When Joanne's turn came, she was still angry over her husband's desertion. Joanne, at, 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 during the interview, had made some comments about um, uh, her and Walter's relationship that it was not good anymore, uh, that she, in fact, wanted a divorce. Uh, she made the comment that if, in fact, Walter was gone or dead, that good riddance. Um, so she was not happy with Walter at all. Their relationship was very weak. Uh, she wanted out of the, the uh, marriage, uh, but here again, she did not indicate that she was involved in any way with Walter's disappearance. Detectives refused to give up the search. They combed Williams' job sites and his property, looking for clues. But Walter Noteice was nowhere to be found. It was as if the earth had swallowed him up. In April of 1986, six months after Joanne Noteis had divorced her husband, she and Jim Williams tied the knot. Neither suspected it would soon become a noose. Then a coincidence sent police down a familiar road, but with a brand new point of view. At the exact spot where Sharon Williams had fatally crashed her car, a second car plowed into the ditch. It landed at precisely the same place as the Williams car, indicating it was going the same speed. But this driver emerged without a scratch. Investigators began to rethink Sharon Williams' death. The connection between 
of the death of Sharon and the death of Walter was made when uh, one of the officers that was at the scene uh, had called me and asked me if uh, I recalled that accident and who the husband of this woman was. And, and of course it was Jim Williams. With no new clues to Walter Notice's disappearance, investigators took a closer look at Sharon Williams' fatal accident. In October of 1986, when Chief Medical Examiner Mary Case studied the accident report, she finally saw what others had missed. My opinion after reading all of that material was, I think that it is highly inconsistent, this injury that she has with the accident. I think it's very likely that she had a homicidal assault, blunt trauma to her head, someone beat on her head and caused her to die. This meant the accident might have been staged, but Case couldn't prove it based on the old report. There wasn't enough to implicate a suspect. By this time, the only concrete evidence lay at the bottom of Sharon Williams' grave. In April of 1987, almost four years after Sharon Williams was buried, her remains were exhumed and re-autopsied. The body was very well preserved, and, and uh, uh, after the autopsy, I made the, um, the diagnosis that her cause of death was the head injury, a massive craniocerebral trauma, and that the manner of death was a homicide. Dr. Case's suspicions were confirmed. The accident was now a murder, and Jim Williams was the prime suspect. His rush into Joanne Notice's arms further implicated him in Walter Notice's disappearance. But police still needed a body to prove it. Pursuing any lead, they interviewed Jim Williams' oldest son, Jim Jr. Estranged from his father, he was jailed in Florida for armed robbery. But for an early release, he was willing to talk. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? You need to come on out here? Though detectives refused to deal, Jim dropped hints about a well behind his father's old house. Police hadn't seen a well, but they remembered the large planter. Detectives returned to the suspect's former home. There, they served a search warrant and examined the flower box that Jim Williams had commissioned four years earlier. As police dismantled the planter, they broke open the case. The new owners of the house had no idea they also held a mortgage on a burial plot. We got out there, we brought several investigators with us and uh, began uh, the task of taking apart uh, flower box that had been placed over the top of the cistern. Uh, once the lid was removed from the cistern, uh, it was amazing to us that uh, the body of Walter Scott was floating on top of uh, the water. The body was still clothed in a blue jogging suit. Only now, it wore rope restraints and a bullet hole. Dr. Case made a positive identification. The murdered singer had been found. The x-rays revealed the betrayal. Without even doing an autopsy, you know this is a homicidal death. He didn't bind himself up and get in there and die either from natural, accidental, or suicidal causes. Somebody did this to him. An autopsy confirmed that the victim had been shot once in the back. Though police had suspected foul play almost from the beginning, Forensic science uncovered the entire murderous scheme. Investigators believe that in October of 1983, Jim Williams bludgeoned his wife with a pipe or a crowbar. He then drove her to the country road where he staged the wreck. After he doused the car with gasoline, he started a small fire, hoping to incinerate the evidence. Then he left her for dead, but the rain put a damper on his plan. Though Williams failed to kill his wife with a blow to her head, he finished the job with the stroke of a pen. 
Only two months later, he ambushed Walter Noteis. He bound the body and lowered it into the well, successfully hiding it for years. On April 10, 1987, Jim Williams was arrested for murdering both his former wife and Joanne Noteis's former husband, Walter Noteis. In 1992, Williams was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Joanne Noteis got five years for hindering the prosecution. Forensic science had given the two victims a voice after years of silence. Where the housewife and the singer had been shown no mercy in life, at least in death, they received justice, measure for measure. Detectives know that a cemetery can be an important landmark on the path to the truth. While evidence gleaned there cannot raise the dead, it can sometimes grant peace of mind to those who are left behind. The scene of a murder usually yields a wealth of clues. When properly studied, they can point to a killer. Unfortunately, it's possible for a victim to take crucial evidence to the grave. Then it's up to forensic science to resurrect the truth.